morning again. Good morning. Again, it's great to be here. Thanks for just being here and present uh, in this community. Um, it's a great reminder of, of the lights that we are in this life. And no matter who you are or where you are in the world, if you're a believer, you're a, you're a light uh, in, a, in a dark world to those around you. So here at Las Palmas, you all get an opportunity to shine. Uh, and to, to draw people into a life and a kingdom that uh, God wants them to be in. So last week, we started a, a series about faith. Uh, and the questions we're asking are, are what is faith? Uh, and what does faith look like? Um, how do we, what are examples of faith that we can emulate in our own lives and say, oh, this is what, not only what it is, but what it, what it looks like. The author, so we're spending some time in Hebrews 11, uh, which is called the Hall of Faith. And as the writer of Hebrews is, is reflecting on specifically Genesis, so he's reading his Torah, which is the first five books in our Old Testament. He's, he's wanting his readers, who, who originally were experiencing a lot of trials and, and issues because they accepted Jesus as their Messiah, so, they're, so life is hard. And it's turbulent, and they're losing out on friends and possessions and things. They're being persecuted and struggling. Uh, and the whole, the whole book, which is, which is a letter, but it sounds like a sermon, is designed to encourage them and exhort them and to, to help them understand that Jesus is greater than all these other things uh, that they may be used to, used to hold in high regard in Judaism. So for, for us, all these objects of faith that we can put our faith in, um, God is the ultimate object of our faith. Uh, and Jesus is our Lord and Savior, and he's given us eternity. He's given us something to really hope for, so no matter how hard life seems or is, we don't want to let go of that faith. And as he's reflecting on these, these, these people, um, specifically in Genesis, he's pointing out these acts of faith and saying this is what faith looks like. This is what faith looks like. This is what faith looks like. Uh, and so if we want to be people of faith, then those are examples for us that even in this dark world uh, that's chaotic sometimes and, and troublesome, what, what does it look like for me in my life? How can I look at these examples and, 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 and emulate that for me? And he defines faith like this. He says it's the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Again, it's the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. But it's not just hope in, in some random object. It's not just hope in some, you know, I hope something's going to happen. I hope I'm going to win the lottery. Right? I bought a ticket. I hope it's gonna win, I'm going to win the, you know, the Powerball this week. It's not a hope in this, this thing that's just random or, or less than God. It's hope in God. Uh, and his promises. And as we read scripture and we come to church and we practice the disciplines we talked about before and we are encouraged, we, we know that God has been faithful in his promises in the past and that he's faithful now and that he'll be faithful in the future and that his perspective is much greater and eternal than ours. And we can trust and hope in him through our life, even when life is hard and difficult. Anything less than that is settling for something so small that we can never experience rest in this life. If we settle, if we put our faith or our object of faith in anything under God or less than God, we're going to always experience um, turbulence and, and chaos and turmoil, and, and we'll never really experience peace in this life. So last week, we looked at these these examples of Abel, Enoch, and Noah, uh, and the writer of Hebrews, as he's reflecting on this time period that we read about between 4 and 11, after the fall, as the world is spiraling out of control, he points to these three individuals and, say, and says, look, even in this time frame, here are people that stood out uh, as, as people who lived by faith. And specifically, if you remember with Enoch and with Noah, he said they, they walked with God. They walked with God. It's the same wording that, that back in the garden in Genesis 1 and 2, that, that God is walking in the garden. And the picture for the reader is supposed to receive it, the, the, these, these two individuals as they're living life in this dark, chaotic world that's 
seems to be spiraling out of control, that because their object of faith was God, they could live life just like they were in Eden. They could live life with the peace that comes with knowing that God is ultimately in control. And no matter what the world seems to look like or doing, they can experience something that's beyond what they can see and understand in, in, in our life. And then specifically for Noah, if you remember, he said that he was more righteous than, than, anybody, than anybody at the time. And biblically speaking, righteousness is our relationship with God and others, how, we, that, how that is and how we treat others. And so in a time where people weren't treating him well, right, that people were, were not good to him, he could still be good to them and be righteous because, again, his object of faith was God. And if we keep God our object of faith, we can live like that. We can walk with God and experience life that's different. How we live life will, de- will be determined by where we put our faith and the objects of faith that we have. So how do we live life walking with God? By faith. By faith. By hoping in Him and not, the, not ourselves, not our bank accounts, not our jobs, not our that our friends or family by keeping him first in our lives always. When God remains the main object of our faith and we trust in him, our actions will follow, we'll walk with him, and we can experience life that is different, that's much different than what this world is telling you that they can give you. So, so in my life, I know that there have been times where, um, you, you know, the object of faith shifts, right? And, And it might be a person, it might be a job, it might be, you know, finances, it might be something else. And I know for me, and this might be true for you, that when I think back in those times of my life, those are the, the, the hardest or worst times in my life. The best times in my life is when I can keep God at the center and the focus of my faith. Because then no matter else what's happening, everything else kind of falls into place. And even if it's difficult, I can still have peace and experience rest. In, in, in the chaos. Whenever I put it on anything else, including myself, uh, that's just a recipe for disaster. And so we want to we learn these lessons by looking at these examples in Hebrews 11 and learn how do we live life like they did. And so today we're going to look at Abraham, who's, who's called the father of faith, who lived a life uh, uh, that wasn't perfect, Um, But there are moments of his life that are defined by this faith that was so strong that we can look at and learn uh, for ourselves how how do we exhibit that kind of faith. So this section we look at, and thanks, George, for reading some of it today, we're going to look at three parts of this longer section of of Hebrews. And the first part is his calling, and this is in your notes if you want to take notes at all in in these different sections. This is Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. And we're calling this his calling. It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. So again, if you remember, textually speaking, if you're reading Genesis, one and two is this ideal garden situation when God creates humanity uh, and they're living with him and experiencing life in his presence. That's the intent. But then three, sin enters into the world and then we fall and the world's broken. And we're broken and our natures are bent now. And it's not, and, we're, and humanity is kicked out, and now life is hard. And death enters in, and then 4 through 11, again, is this spiraling down of humanity. It just, the reader is supposed to see, like, humanity getting worse and worse, but, but how God intervenes and how people are still faithful in this time. And then by the time you get to the end of 11, um, you're supposed to wonder what's the, what hope is there for humanity. Uh, It just seems hopeless. Humanity just continues to repeat the same patterns over and over again uh, in the chaos, in our selfishness. Uh, What's what's the plan? Is there a way, is there a path of redemption? And then when you turn to to 12.1, so just go to the next page, this is what you read. This is 12.1, 1 through 3. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, 
Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So we, we, have, we have hope and we have promise. So again, as a reader, you get to the end of 11 and you're like, what is happening? How is it? Can we ever live in an Eden-like existence? Like what is going on? And then you turn to 12 and you see God continuing his promise that he made in Genesis 3, that there will be redemption for humanity. And it's going to be through the seed of, of Abram, of Abraham, who's just a random guy at this point who God calls and asks him to leave his, his family, his community, his comfort, his, you know, uh, all the things that you, that you have over the course. He's not a young guy. He's a little older at this time, but so he's got all the, he's set, right? And God says, why don't you follow me and put your faith in me and leave all that behind? And if you follow me, I'm going to bless you and through your seed, I'll bless all of humanity. And so all of this stuff, his family and his comfort, his familiarity, he leaves behind. He leaves behind because he shifts his objects of faith to all of that stuff to God. And when, so when God calls him, he says, okay, let's go. And here's the, here's the question I think that he had to answer. And it's the question that we have to answer every day. And that's, can you trust God with the unknown? Can you trust God with the unknown? Because the unknown is scary. But guess what? Tomorrow is the unknown. <laughs> Later today is the unknown. And we, and we seek comfort and we seek uh, solace and we seek uh, like everything or our foundation and the things that we can see again in ourselves or our family or our bank accounts or whatever. And God's just asking, can you trust me with the unknown? Because if you can trust me with the unknown and I call you to to leave it all behind, you'll say, okay. And this is actually the story of all of us when we accept Christ as our Savior because you, you're trusting God with the unknown right now. I don't think any of you have experienced death yet. Right? We're all still here. But we don't know, right? Wait, there's an unknown to death, but we know and we have hope because we read about the promises that God has delivered and done already and what he says will happen in the future. So there's unknown, but there's also hope, but a hope that's not just in a random thing, but a hope that's in God, who is eternal and all-powerful and, and who loves you, and who loves you, and who loves me, and he wants you to experience life today that's different than, than what all these other things can, can supply. And it's scary, uh, but, but what do we trust in most is what we have to ask ourselves every day. Abraham becomes our example of trusting God in the unknown and leaving behind or putting behind the things that we used to trust in or the things that we sometimes trust in more. Because every day can be a struggle. It can be a back and forth, right? Like I start the day with maybe <coughs> prayer, devotions, reading. I'm on track and then all of a sudden my object of faith shifts to something else. And we got to pull ourselves back, right? And so it can be a daily struggle. Uh, but we have to do the things, the disciplines and the community and the, and the encouragement and the worship to keep ourselves focused on God first. And when we do, then the peace we can receive is much greater than the, the things that we have. So the question is, when we, when we, when we see the, the, the last part of this, he says uh, he, he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. And it's interesting because we can, we can make ourselves the designer and builder of our lives or, or someone else or the things that we have. And so the question is, who is the designer and builder of your life? Who is the designer and builder of your life? Because Abraham trusted that when he left everything behind, that what laid ahead, whatever it was, if God was designing it and building it, then it was going to be greater, even if it was looking forward to eternity and not just what he would experience in life. And that's amazing.
So his calling is the first step here. The second step is his journey. This is his journey. Uh, this, is a, this is 11 uh, through 16. It says, By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. See, God had promised Abraham that, that, that he would be the father of a great nation, that through his descendant, his seed, there'd be a blessing to all of humanity, uh, who, who eventually is Jesus. But as Abraham grew and got older, this wasn't, this wasn't quite happening. And in this passage, he highlights, the author is highlighting the faith of Sarah and Abraham and the, and the outcome uh, that they had in their, in their faith. But however, his, his journey, if, we, if you read the, the accounts of, of Abraham, um, his, his journey wasn't always perfect, right? He, he actually makes some big mistakes that we, we read about in the account because we want to see that, the, you know, this isn't a perfect guy. He just knows when to put his trust in God, uh, and through that, he, he's righteous. But he does make big mistakes. So, for instance, two, on two separate occasions, when, when things get tough in the land and there's famine, he goes into cities, and he says that his wife is his sister, which is never a good idea, guys. Okay? <laughs> it's never a good idea. But he does it because he becomes afraid. His object of faith shifts from God, who who can take care of him to what he's seeing. And so he, he makes a decision on his own and he goes in. And even though those decisions lead to issues and turmoil, God still intervenes. Uh, and Abraham gets out of those situations, but benefits financially from them. So he receives more from his own his mistakes. Uh, and that can be good and bad. <laughs> uh, but, but God intervenes even when Abraham makes bad mistakes. And then in later, when they're not having a child and they're a little older, and again, what, what, you know, what they see and, and the physical ability at the time and what they know, uh, they're disheartened. And they have this plan that they'll take matters in their own hands uh, and they'll take advantage of their servant, Hagar, who they got from one of those cities that they went into earlier. She's Egyptian, and one of those was an early uh, Egyptian city. So one mistake leads to another, and this mistake, this mistake, him um, sleeping with her and having Ishmael, those effects are still around today, right? So, so these mistakes are big mistakes. Uh, he is not living a perfect life here. But God takes care of them, and God takes care of Ishmael and Hagar and... Um, and so again, here we see his faith highlighted, but again, we know that he didn't always choose wisely. And this is an example of our, for our own lives too. Life can be defined by our faith, but we can have missteps. Uh, even Abraham, the father of faith, failed at times. And it's okay, we, we, we all fail too, and we have, and, and we will. But the idea is, can we get back on track? Can we get back on focus? Can we get, put God back at the center? Even when we tend to shift it sometimes, and, and maybe your mistake isn't going to a city and telling somebody your wife's your sister, or, or making a mistake that linger, the effects linger for, you know, for thousands of years, uh, but, but they happen. But there's, that gives me a little bit of peace, knowing that even though I'm not perfect and there's times that I fail, God's still faithful in my failures. Uh, to his promises for me, like he was to Abraham, because his faithfulness is greater than our failures. And that's really good to know. 
God's faithfulness is greater than our failures. And, 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 and he knows that, there, you know, in this life, it won't be 100% <laughs> focused in faith. There will there, be shifts. But just like we talked about in the, in the spiritual discipline series, it should be an upward, like we should be moving forward in our faith through the course of our lifetime and getting stronger and closer to be like Jesus, although we'll never be perfect. But God is faithful even in our failures to his promises. And then the other part of the passage is about what we are really looking forward to. Is it what you can achieve on earth? Is it what you have? Is it what you build? Or is it what God has for you? Because what they say is uh, Abraham and his descendants, they, they, they knew the promise. They looked forward to the promise. They, they, they had faith in it. They followed God, but they never saw the end result. They never got to see the result that came until, until afterlife. But can we trust God to that degree? Or are we holding on so strong to the things that we know but at the end of the day, if we can let go of some of those things, what we could see might be something much greater than what we're holding, holding on to. And so these lessons of faith are really important because what we determine is the most important things to us is going to determine how we live. What we determine that we're holding on to is so important that will be the direction that we go. And so we got we to gotta shift those things or let go of some things or forgive some things uh, and know that what God promises us is greater than that. And the peace, again, that we can receive from that, even if we don't see an outcome in this life that is greater, we'll, we'll experience something even greater and even more. So his journey is like our journey. And hopefully as Christians, our journey is more defined by our moments of faith and, and putting God as the main object than it is our failures. But there will be times of failures. But if, if you can write that down, that his faithfulness is greater than our failures, that's a good reminder every day. The third part here then is his test, Abraham's test. It says, by faith, Abraham, uh, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he uh, who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. This is one of the, one of the biggest faith moments that we see uh, for Abraham's life. And even for scripture, it's used, it's used a lot, even in, uh, in literature, uh, for, the, for a test of faith. And sometimes we read it or someone reads it and they're like, why would God ask him to sacrifice his son? That seems pretty... That seems a little crazy, right? Like, like you know, sacrifice your son is, is, a, is a big ask for someone. Uh, but why was, the question is, why was Abraham willing to do it? Why was he willing to do it? And there's a couple reasons here. I think one, because he was a teenager. And like, I'll tell you, if God, there's, there's times that if God asks me, I'd be like, oh, okay. Uh, but, but that's just one. The other one is, is the writer of Hebrews tells us. He says he believed that God was able to what? To raise the dead. To raise the dead, right? He was able, he believed that God was able to raise the dead. And, and by this, like, he's like a teenager at this time, so this is years later. And so as he's seeing God fulfill his promises, he's growing, right, in his faith and trust. And at this point, he's at the point where he can say, even if I sacrifice him, God can raise him. So the question for us is, do you believe that God can raise the dead? Do you, do you have trust at that level? I, I hope so, because that's why you're here, right? Jesus was raised from the dead. You believe, in, that, you believe that he could do it, he can do it already. And, and what's cool about that is if we believe in God and his promises, if we believe that he can raise the dead, if we believe there's eternity ahead of us, then death becomes something we don't have to fear. We don't have to be scared of it. Death is the thing that humans are afraid of the most. Actually, public speaking is number one. And then death is number two, <laughs> right? Most people, more people would rather die than speak in public. Uh, but, but death is up there. But we don't have to fear it. But, so hu humanity, humans do so many things to prevent death. Um, it's, it's, like, it's like an obsession. 
But this is what Paul says about, about our, what we should view, how we should view death. Uh, this is in 1 Corinthians. He says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. That whole section in 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about that God has overcome death. And we don't have to fear it because death just leads to eternity. And being with the presence of God now and then a, a new creation at the end uh, that we can experience a, a different world and a different life forever. And it's beautiful. And this is what Abraham understood even then. And he trusted God more than, more than his own life. And so they, when you read the account in Genesis, it doesn't just become an account of, of asking, like, why would, God, why would God ask somebody to do that? It becomes an account of of two main points. The first is to see the faith of Abraham and say, man, he trusted God because he believed at that level. Do I believe God at that level too? Do I believe God at that level too? And then secondly, that God provided, that he didn't have to do it, right? That even though he he was going to and he believed something about God at a certain level, God God came and provided for him just like God provides for us. So God could ask you to leave or do something or go and our trust level should be that high, but God will provide always for you and something more than what you left behind or what you, what, what you, what you were holding on to or thought about. And so it becomes this, this lesson for us as the readers. Again, not just like, oh, this is a crazy ask of God, but do I have that level of faith? Do I trust that God can even raise the dead? And again, I hope we all do. Do I trust God for what I can't see, for eternity, for all these things? Can I trust that level, but then also know that God will provide? When I step out in faith at the levels that God wants me to, because it's going to be scary, because the unknown is scary, do I know he'll provide for me? And that picture becomes the picture that's, that's developed through scripture of the Messiah and and the sacrifice that he has for us, right? He provided the sacrifice for us so that, you know, the death that we deserve, Jesus took on. And so now we can experience this life. We can experience eternity. And God doesn't want us to just like have that in our pockets, like I've accepted Jesus and that's good. He actually wants us to live now like we would be living life in the garden, walking with him. And having faith that leads us, even in the unknown, to peace and to rest. And that's beautiful. So how do we bring this all together? And this is the last line in your notes here. It says, real faith starts with and continues with trusting God. Real faith starts with and continues with trusting God. Just like we saw in this account as as the writer of Hebrews is reflecting on Abraham and his life, and just quickly going through his calling, his journey, and his, his test. And he, again, there's so many more things he could highlight, but he's just pointing out these moments of, of times where his faith level was so strong in God and saying, this is what it looks like to have faith. This is what it looks like to have faith. And can we experience life like that in those moments, not in the moments that He's going into cities, telling them his wife's his sister. But in these, in these moments, can we, can we be like Abraham? And the answer is yes, we can. We can walk with God in this life. As hard or dark or chaotic or, or stressful or anxious it can be, we can experience life walking with God. Can we look at our own lives and say, despite the moments of failing, our lives are still defined by faith? And just, you know, for know we are forgiven, sometimes have to forgive ourselves or others because of times of failure, but, but know that we're in Christ and we're justified and we're growing. And, and again, even in moments of failure, can we just say that my life is defined by faith? 
Are we trusting in God and what he has prepared and promised for us more than what we can see and experience in this world? Are we trusting God and what he has for us more than our families, our bank accounts, careers, you know, friends? Those things are good, and we want to trust in those. But again, when, whatever the object of your faith is, you're going to trust in it. And then that trust is going to lead to actions like we talked about last week. Uh, And all those lesser things are good to have trust in and to know that, you know, your friends are there for you and your family and, you know, all these things that God wants for you. But again, what's the, what's the main object of your faith? What's the top one? It's got to be God and it's got to be him all the time. When we do that, then we'll experience the peace that God wants for us all the time, all the time. So I'll end with this. This is John 14, 27. This is what Jesus says. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I'll read that again. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He's giving you his peace. He's giving you his peace. And it's different than the world. He says, not as the world gives do I give to you. It's different. You can, you can try to embrace what the world wants to give you and the comfort and peace and rest that, that the world promises or that you think you might even be promising yourself. But what God wants to give you is so much greater. And so he says, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Let's keep our object of our faith, God. Learn the lessons from these these people that we're reading about in Hebrews 11 and live a life that's different, experiencing peace even in the chaos, walking with God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word, for your comfort, for your promises. Thank you that we can know that that you're the creator and the sustainer of the world, that your power is so much greater than ours, your perspective is, your knowledge is, and and help us to embrace that and know that and trust that and have faith in that every day and and help us to, to, to move towards you in that in our lives, to embrace what faith can look like for us and help us to experience peace in this life. Even though it's challenging and hard and chaotic, Help us walk with you every day. In Jesus' name, amen.